Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger. On this episode of Jill on Money, are you your own worst enemy when it comes to networking? If your work is sending you to a conference, then don't hide in the corner. Like, be open while you're there. It doesn't mean personally open, obviously, about everything. It just means, you know, your friend says, I really want you to meet so-and-so because you have a lot in common. Be open to that meeting. Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. We are presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Are you shy? Are you the kind of person who does not like to promote yourself? Do you hate the work of networking? Well, then our guest is perfect for you. Her name is Karen Wickery. She is a longtime veteran of Silicon Valley. She happens to be a communications person who's a little shy. But Karen has written a book, an update to her previous work. It's called Taking the Work Out of Networking, Your Guide to Making and Keeping Great Connections. So here's our interview with Karen Wickery. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. So let's start the interview with a very important question. Here at the Jill on Money podcast, we like to ask you, what was the best career or financial decision you ever made? It almost doesn't feel like a decision. I have to say I'd been freelancing in San Francisco where I live um, during the downturn nobody remembers in 2000, 2001. And I had a lot of contacts around Silicon Valley. And one of them had told me she had started at a new funny little company called Google. Huh, funny. And (laughs) she, she went there in 1999. Uh, so I kept in touch with her. We talked. I called her once. Hey, do you have any work? First she said, no, we're full up. And then she said, you know what? We do need somebody if you can come in as a contract writer. And like from the the second time I went in, I suppose, I said, hey, I want to work here. I want to work here. Mm-hmm. So it was maybe didn't feel like a decision. It felt more like this is the course I have to take. But I uh, I overcame my fear of that commute. Let's just say. <laughs> All right. So let's go back in time. Yeah. So what were you doing before that? Let's take us through a little bit of your your own career. So you you graduate from college, and you did you grow up in the Bay Area? No, I'm I'm a Washington D.C. native. Aha. Uh-huh. And I went to a little college in Ohio. My dad died senior year. I went back to D.C. No no career plan, and I have to say I was an American studies major, <laughs> which is to say literature and history and art all the way. Yeah, you're a liberal arts so gal. I, I had no plan, but of course my mom had made me take typing in high school, and thank God, <laughs> thank God for that. So I didn't have a plan. I went to graduate school in D.C. at GW, another degree in American studies. Still no, still what no plan. What were you going to do? You wanted to maybe be a professor? No, I don't think so. I think I just liked school and studying, but I also was also having office jobs where I typed, right? That, I mean, that was the, that was the thing. And then I happened to get a job there uh, after I graduated from GW that happened to be on the subject of my master's thesis, which is like unheard of. So I became an oral historian. Oh, cool. For a grant project. And I interviewed people who'd worked in the WPA in the, in the thirties for two years. It was it was awesome and it kind of helped me. It was like I was shy for sure and I was definitely introverted, but I also it was a job to talk to people, but it was all one to one. Yeah. All one to one. Not and a you group. get to ask the question. So like I have a friend who's a professional photographer and she always says that it's the perfect job for an introvert because you can be behind the lens. Exactly. And you have a lot a lot of power. But yes. not a lot of responsibility. Yeah, exactly. You 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 want to draw them out, right? And that is that's a key to networking as as you know from the book too. Anyway, fast forward, I had a variety of basically nonprofit organizational jobs over time. And then I had come to San Francisco in 1984, another nonprofit job, but that was a media related job. It was for journalists. It was a, it was an organization for journalists. Mm-hmm. And one of the board members was one of the first, uh, he was a publisher of some of the up and coming personal computer magazines. Mm-hmm. And so I knew nothing about that world, but he hired me. He, he was a weird guy and he, it's not Dan Farber, is it? No, although I know him very right. well. I thought you were about to actually yeah. give me no, a perfect this description is where of I Dan. Met, <laughs> this is where I met Dan Farber, <laughs> who used to do Tai Chi in the hallways. Yeah, and he yeah, still does. And still does. <laughs> 
Anyway, yes, so that is where I met him, but it was PC World Magazine yeah. and Mac World Magazine. And I just happened to, you know, get along with and could understand the, the founder of these, David Bennell. So that was really my leap into the but world. The, and so this is a job where essentially it is, are you writing, editing, Yes, a to bit that, and I was a little bit maybe a kind of a chief of staff. Yeah. I kind of helped him on new projects, and I was kind of a liaison to the editorial teams. Mm-hmm. I just, I mean, I was a sponge. I, I learned about magazines there. I learned about, to the extent that it was possible, technology at that time, which now is like primitive. Right, right. right. But that, that was the beginning of working in tech, Right. right. So that was, you know, 30 years ago. You were working through the mid 80s, through the end of the 90s, the tech and, and in various almost uh, those kinds of roles, journalistic, right. um, editorial. editorial kind of roles. Okay. Yes. So now your friend, employee number three at right. Google, who's a gazillionaire. <laughs> thank you very much. Now, I hope she's happy. I, I um, hope so. Right. I think so. OK, mm-hmm. good. Now you get in the door at Google as a freelancer and you, an introverted freelancer, what are you doing? You're writing a little bit. And then are you doing something in your own mind, methodically saying, how can I make this a full-time gig? Or are you doing that naturally? So I, w- I was hired into my friend Cindy's team. This was her group, communications, right? PR, small team. This is at a time Google had between five and 600 employees. Hmm. It was kind of all hands on deck. And fortunately, I'm a pretty quick kind of utility writer, so I can write a little ad copy. I can, I'm a good editor, I can make something into, you know, an op-ed. I just did a hodgepodge of things. I edited whatever somebody would let me edit, Mm. always making it better in my view. And so I was just kind of a utility kind of writer. I saw from the beginning, I have to be so indispensable, so utilitarian that they want to have me around. They didn't have a role for me. Uh huh. And it took about 15 months for somebody to come up with headcount to yeah. add me as a new thing. And I called myself, I said, I want my title to be senior editor. Okay. And you that's, made it, that's made a it big up, tent. right? Yeah. I like yeah. that. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? I love the idea that you sort of go in there and you say, okay, I got a job to do. I'm going to be a sponge. So I feel like these are all like life lessons For that you sure. actually have in the, and yeah. you make yourself indispensable and liked. How can I, somebody who's a little shy about that do something that you did, which was kind of make yourself indispensable, create your own title and, you know, get that yeah. career going? Well, two things. I mean, one is I was not new to technology, right? So I already had kind of working knowledge and contacts and experiences that were definitely helpful Mm. uh, in in terms of, you know, not being like, wow, what is this crazy thing called Google? Like I'd already reviewed it as a search engine Uh for one of my, you know, columns somewhere. You know, I had credibility coming in, even though all the all the immediate people around me didn't know me. But I think the other thing is the mission of Google really spoke to me. I mean, if it had been you know, banking or insurance or something, I'm not sure I would have put myself out there as much. It would have been more a job. But I mm-hmm. thought, A, remember the downturn. I was kind of desperate. I just bought my first house. Desperation <laughs> works, Desperation right? was good. Mm-hmm. But also, I, you know, I knew Cindy who ran the group. I'm just, I'm just all in on this. And so for that reason, I was, I mean, I'm always friendly. I'm a girl from the 50s. So it's all about being likable, right? We all want to be likable. So that part wasn't hard, but I just thought, I'm going to, how can I help? What can I do to, you know, add to whatever you're doing? How long were you at Google? Nine years. And then why did you leave? By the end, as much as I loved it and as incredible an experience, by the end, there were 50,000 employees. So 500 to 50,000 is yeah. something else. Yeah. That was, I Explosive. felt like I watched it grow up. I really, I, I which was a fantastic experience. I wasn't doing anything new. I was Mm. now someone who people would send me, you know, newbies to say, here's how you navigate around the company. Uh, And meanwhile, you know, I was still, I mean, I was all about publishing and writing. I I built up the whole Google blog network and I had my eye on and was familiar with a new publishing platform, Newist, called Twitter. And I knew a bunch of people there and and I I just thought, well, that might be interesting. Mm -hmm. The original team had already, the founders were gone. So it was now in the hands of Dick Costolo and Ali Bergani had come in. 
as the executive. So, and I thought, well, they seem serious, right? They're, yeah. you know, they, they want to go places. And so somebody I knew there created kind of a job that was perfect for me called editorial director. And what does that job do? What are you doing in that it's, job? It's, it's in communication still, and it's essentially corporate communication. So these days we call this kind of thing a company's news and information channels that they own. We call that owned content, right? Mm-hmm. We didn't call it that then, but it's just, it's that idea. It's sort of like, so the company blog, the company social accounts. Yep. Well, at Twitter, interesting, of course, Twitter has to have a Twitter account. Right. Uh, and Twitter had had a blog, but it was kind of dormant. So it was sort of like building up, what are we going to talk about? And that's just not product announcements. I, right. I have an editorial view on that. And then how do you use social to amplify? And so what year was that that you joined Twitter? 2011. And you lasted for how long there? Almost five years. 2016 I left. And why did you leave there? Twitter had quite a few ups and downs. And um, it was a fascinating experience of a very different company than Google. And I'm glad I did it. But I was kind of, I'd been run through the ringer, to be Mm -hmm. honest, a little Mm -hmm. bit. What does that mean? Well, I just, you know, we'd had a couple rounds of layoffs, a lot of executive change, a lot of executive turnover, and it just, it was wearing. It was hard. Mm -hmm. I had a team. I had to try and keep up their spirits while I was, you know, feeling, ugh, another one, you know. Yes. It was, it was, it was just a little wearing. Uh, So I felt like, I think I'm ready now to just kind of hang out my shingle. Okay, and so that's what you do now. That's what I you do You hang now. out your shingle, you yep. write, you edit, yep. you wrote a book. And yep. so let's talk a little bit, about, and then we'll get back to Twitter and yeah. why I think it's evil cesspool. But okay. you're going to teach me how to use it better, right? I hope so. I want to start with the idea that you laid out that I thought was really good, which is I think a lot of people will hear networking and they're like, eh, I don't want to do that. Yep. Or that's annoying. Everyone or, hates right? it. Right? Yep. I don't. I love it because I am just a voyeur. So I just like to ask questions. So- you have something called the 11 Organizing Principles of No Pressure Networking. And the number one I really do want to focus on, which is be open. I think this is really hard for people. Why is it so important to be open in that networking mantra of like, here's what you need to do? It means to me being open to the opportunity. In other words, if your work is sending you to a conference – then don't hide in the corner. Like, be open while you're there. It doesn't mean personally open, obviously, about everything. It just means, you know, your friend says, I really want you to meet so-and-so because you have a lot in common. Be open to that meeting, Mm -hmm. right? Be open to someone saying, you know, I'd I'd like to take you out for coffee because I want to hear about... Say yes. I love the... um the number five here, don't limit your context. Can you explain what that means? Yeah. So I think I've been fortunate in having so many kind of serendipitous moments where people cross over lines. We Like we all have professional contacts, our work colleagues, maybe our former classmates or whatever, or, you know, past colleagues, but we don't necessarily think about them in relation to maybe what we want to know about now Mm. or no I can only talk to someone else in the exact role that I want and it's like well maybe I can't find you that but I can find someone at the company who could maybe introduce you to that person it's an ongoing chain right so don't be so like I don't know what that person could do for me so no Right. That's not being open no that is not (laughs) and also I think that it is it it is a, a maybe a defensive mechanism, right, that we put yeah. up a wall because now yeah. we're like, I don't know if I want to put myself out there really, right. right? So you also have sort of this concept of like a loose touch. Mm-hmm. I like that. I, I can you be heavy do it. I do it all the time. But yeah. that's but it comes very naturally to me. So yeah. I, no one had to tell me how to network. I yeah. was just basically a voyeur, so I like yeah. people. And I'm a matchmaker. Yeah. What is it that is preventing us from asking? And then how can we build that loose touch concept into our day-to-day? So we hate asking because typically we're the one in need at the moment. It's either your friend wanting to help her son or somebody like, uh-oh, you know, reorg coming. I got to get a new job. You know, your new boss is terrible. I got to get out. So you feel like the clock is ticking. Who do I know who I can ask? It's It becomes a very transactional thing. And then you think, well, how well do I know them? And are they, how busy are they? And how important are they? And, you know, it's it just, you're anxious about the whole thing mm-hmm. and you're needy. 
right? And you think, oh, this other person has the key to my happiness. That's that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. So part of it is just if you're all the time keeping in touch with people, lose touch, which I'll talk about in a minute, then you are more in the practice of just saying of the give and get of it, because I'm sure you also ask people for things from time to time. Sure. Rather than having it be this, it's a one and done transaction and then I owe them. Mm-hmm. That's We have to get away from that. This is why people hate networking, right? So keeping in loose touch is something I do as a matter of habit because I too am a connector. And I like also just knowing what's going on with people. That's the thing that I've always done. And I, 95% of that I do online, which is easy for an introvert. Mm-hmm. But loose touch is something you don't do with strangers. You do this with people you already know somewhat, mm-hmm. right? Or well, obviously, but the way, you know, you might do this is we'll get to Twitter later, I know. But if you if I see something in my feed on Twitter that is I know will be of interest to someone, I send a private message. Right. And I just say, thinking of you when I read this, it doesn't have to be my best friend. It can be someone I've worked with in the past, someone whose company is they're being talked about or something like that. Just like thinking of you, how are you? Thought you'd want to see this. Right. I mean, it's the equivalent of you know, people used to like paperclip a note to an article and put it in the mail, which is sadly <laughs> I still do that. Uh, no, I don't. I do, I do carry around physical newspapers, but I do often like will uh, highlight something and something. hand it. Yeah, and just yeah. say like, hmm, this is interesting. Yeah, or saw you mentioned in yeah. this article, right? Yeah. And and I should add, of course, this doesn't only have to happen on Twitter. Email is perfectly legitimate for this, or you know, whatever your other channels. But LinkedIn. this is just like being almost neighborly. It's yes, almost exactly. it's sort of a weird thing. Like when you think about that in a digital society, sometimes you can really, you can feel lonely. You, you're connected, yeah. but lonely, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is just a way to sort of break through that and yeah. say, hey, I saw this about you. And then it's sort of the best of social. It's That's the right. best of connecting. That's right. It's not, it shouldn't be onerous. No, it should be, be fun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they're also, these things don't require these little notes and sort of, you know, with a little touch point. They don't require, they're not an obligation for the other person. You're not saying, can I have lunch with you? I need a favor. You're just keeping in touch so that, not so that, and that when you occasionally need to be in touch with that same person about something, you, you've you had, you were all kind of in the ether together, right? And right. so you've had that, those moments, you've kind of maybe exchanged a couple of these notes. Mm. And then it's like, hey, can I actually have coffee with you? Can I buy you coffee? Because I want to talk to you about X. This is Jill on Money. Hey, gang, it's me, Jill Schlesinger. You know that. You're listening to The Pod. Certified financial planner, CBS News business analyst, host of this here podcast, Jill on Money. And I am here to tell you about our sponsor, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. They're helping people achieve financial well-being with simple and transparent banking products, including Clarity Money. That's a free personal finance management app that's part of the Marcus family. Clarity Money is your AI-powered financial champion that shows you a simple view of your finances together in one place. They recently launched a weekly budgeting feature that you've just got to try. The app does the hard part for you and calculates your average weekly spend by category. You can take that information so you can set informed budget goals based on what matters most to you. You can also subscribe to budget alerts to help keep you on track and start with a clean slate every week. Who doesn't want that? It's super easy to use and can make a task like budgeting kind of fun. So go check it out. Download Clarity Money through Google Play or iTunes or visit Marcus.com forward slash Clarity. And now back to our interview with Karen Wickery. When you're going to make that ask, do you come through the front door? Do you say like, I have a favor to ask you or can I do this? Do you like to do that like sort of up front or do you sort of? Yeah. No, I would. I would say usually I'm going to give some more context. So unless I know them pretty well, it's probably by email. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'll say, hope you're well, saw your latest thing, you're great. And I have a favor to ask. Here's the favor, you know, and give them the specifics. Like it's someone I want to introduce you to. It's a Mm -hmm. question my friend has about blah. At your convenience, like may I connect you or may I 
point and them to you for that. I love that you say that in the book because you say you do not make a connection without getting permission from one person. Correct. I mean, that's no a big no-no. No cold no calls. No calls. <laughs> I do that all the time. And I find that um, it's funny because often when I'm at work, people will ask me financial advice because I used to be a financial planner and a money manager. I say, I don't do that anymore. But I'd be happy to hook you up with uh, so-and-so, Joe Blow, down the street. And then I will say, is that okay? Do you want me to make a connection or do you just want me to take give you the information you do it on your own? Yeah. No, 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 make the connection. Yeah. Then I'll call advisor A, B, or C. Yep. Say, here's a deal. Karen needs some help. She's a colleague of mine, great gal, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, this is what I think the context is. I'd be appreciative if you kind of took care of her. Yep. And I like to sort of smooth it out. Yep. And you say that's kind of very important to at least yeah. before you start making connections. Yeah, because, I mean, I have to say I have like a, you know, 99% hit rate this way because people say, people will now say to me, anyone you want to introduce me to is fine. Just d- don't Just even do hesitate. It. But I still ask because I want to have, have that moment of giving them, here's the context. Because sometimes, and I will do this myself, you know what? I'm not the right person for this particular yeah. thing. But either let me talk to them because I then I'll pass them on mm. or instead I'd like to introduce you to so-and-so and they are going to be the one who knows more about this. And I think that's so smart, right? Yeah. Um, you did mention just briefly email and you say that yeah. email is the killer app. Why is that? It's still the only way. First of all, it's a platform that is, you know, everybody uses. I know only old people now. Yeah, I was just about it. to say, I would like to introduce you to my nieces and nephews, yeah, right. but I, know. I have to train. But it's funny, even my nieces and nephews who, all right, well, so through through relationship, but let's just say the younger ones, who, yeah. so the under 35s, they all sort of blow off email until they get to work. That's right. And then at work, yeah. they have to deal with old farts like us, yeah. and then they got to be on email. Yeah. Because email is the most interoperable of the all these things, right? It's not a something everybody has, everybody else's connects. Uh, but the other thing is you can just give more context there. So you have to know how to write a good email, maybe to someone you don't know well, and to say, here's the context of what I'm asking or what I'd like to know about, or can you point me to someone who has more info on this or somebody I want to recommend or wh- whatever it is. You you really can't do that in a private message. In fact, on LinkedIn, where you you could do it, I always say to people, let's take this off LinkedIn and just into email because I just get tired of checking there for a whole other line of correspondence. One thing you don't mention, because you do mention email, but I'm turning into my mother before your eyes. You don't know my mother, but the great Susan, she will say to me, I still like the phone. Yeah. I really like to hear your voice because I like to hear what's really going on. Yeah. And I, too, have come to this conclusion that often when someone is trying to engage me, whether it's on social or even an email, that they are shocked when I just call them. Right. So what about the phone in this? The phone for sure has a place. I mean, I myself have cut off long email threads that between a few people or something contentious with someone. It's like, we're not doing this by email. No. It's time for a call. Right. So I think the thing about calling is, you may do it on the spur and you may get away with that. But I think for most of us, it's appointment calling. Yeah, right? it's sort I of agree. Like, can we make a time for a call about this yes, thing? Right. And that could also include a video chat, I might add. Right. And I do that sometimes with friends who are not, you know, we're, we, they, they're in other countries. So it's like, let's make a phone date can mean let's have a video chat at this appointed time in our respective time zones. Right. But yes, there's absolutely a place for that. I think that's... Uh, most easily done with people you already know and people maybe you genuinely like and want to have a conversation with. Otherwise, there's so much more efficiency to the the groundwork before that. Well, that's when I think having like a digital entryway, like if you text somebody and yeah. say like, I get this, like, I don't want to write a million, I'm walking my dogs, call me. Yeah, yeah that's question, right. Yeah, call me. Like that's the right. producer needs to talk to me, call me. Now, I'd love to shift gears a bit yep. and go into the, um, how shall we say, the AARP conversations yeah, yeah. that we have. So the over 50s, of which I am a proud member. Same. Um, <laughs> what is it about being over 50 in the workplace right now that people need to know? Because I'm going to give you two sides. So on one side, I think... The over 50 is the best networking group ever. You have a network. Yeah. You actually have you lived have a life, one. Yeah. right? On the other hand, there is a certain uh, fear or maybe anxiety around engaging 
on some of the newer platforms that prevent you from engaging in a way that might be helpful to you. So what you're over 50 networking, working, not working, coming back into the labor force out of the what, what do we need to know? There's a couple things. I mean, for people who have not been, shall we say, digital, may, maybe email for work, but nothing else. I hate to say it. I hate to pile on, but it is important to be on LinkedIn. And I'll tell you why in a sec. Mm-hmm. And it's important not to to be familiar with these various tools. Obviously, some may be required by your work because if you, you know, sort of express dismay about them or you say, oh, God, I can't, you know, do another new thing or something, that is going to end up being a mark against you, right? This leads to the silent but deadly age discrimination. Which is real. It, it is real. Uh, it's very hard to prove, it happens, but most people, you get edged out, right? You, right. It's and not, they, they and, don't say you're too old. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's hard to prove. Know, it is hard to prove. I mean, yeah, most of my friends who've been in this situation, you know, if I could, I pointed them to a lawyer to help them get a decent severance. I will say that, and I did learn this at Google, I observed this, and it really didn't have to do with age. But what I noticed is they weren't hiring people on the basis of what they'd done before only, Right. They, yes, they wanted experience and expertise in certain things, but to just rest on that and say, well, this is how we did it back there. And so that's what I'm going to do here. No, they want to know, you know, and, and I think most modern companies are more into this now, sort of like, how do you think about problems? How do you collaborate? Right. How do you problem solve? You know, are you do you have social skills? Because that that's important in a workplace. Let's now go back to these platforms. Yeah. So you left Twitter in 2016 before or after the election? It was before. It was it was a few months before. You know this guy Scott Galloway who yeah. had, right? Yeah. He he has, always has a funny comment. He says that Twitter should like lay down their souls. Every single person should like pray at the president's footsteps because the president single-handedly made Twitter a much more relevant and important social media device than it was prior to the election. Agree or disagree? Oh, disagree. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Look, it's a quirky platform. It's not for everybody. It's not like the others. It should not be compared to Facebook. It's not in the same business as Facebook in a way. But the thing about it is your whole experience there is dependent on who you choose to follow. You have more of a journalist bent or editorial writer journalist bent. I do. What responsibility does Twitter and Facebook or any of these other platforms have to making sure that they are not amplifying lies? There's a few tricky things about this. I do understand why these companies don't want to be considered publishers. They would say it's not our information right they they would say we're like the phone company this is an old an old yes. l- kind of legal case we're just the carrier right right we we wouldn't listen to all the phone messages we can't possibly okay and that is true in terms of scale any platform that says and facebook ha- has said this several times you know we're hiring 10,000 more people 20,000 more people to monitor to you know moderate you can't hire enough people no the, the scale of the messages, the videos on YouTube, for example. I mean, it's just the scale is something people cannot imagine. So that is like super whack-a-mole. Some things they have done, and I think it's it's a continuing arms race to be sure because the bad actors are more and more sophisticated about how they use these tools. And there are more and more uh, ways to have these deep fake videos and these you know audio alterations and all these things. So that's ongoing. That's just the world we live in. For them, I think a couple of things. One is, and I think they do this, but they they can't really talk about it is my guess. The under the hood stuff in terms of what they're monitoring and ideally seeing among the platform. I hope they're talking among themselves in the background to say, we're seeing this, you know, we're seeing weird signups or we've discovered this bot, but it's maybe all maybe on Twitter and YouTube, you know, for example, mm-hmm. or Something is happening on Facebook, but it's similar to this other thing. They need to have pretty easy way to have those conversations and discovery so that they can uh, stop things earlier, maybe before they're even, you know, out the gate. Sort of like, what are suspicious account signups, right? Mm -hmm. When they're created overnight, like, oh, really? 
ten thousand from Macedonia last night. You yeah, know, it seems like, odd. <laughs> But so they, anyway, but they they're those so, kind of things. But they seem so reluctant. I mean, look, I work yeah. for a news organization. Yeah. We can't put crap out there that's not true. Right. Okay? And we get whacked if we do. And they really want it both ways. Yeah. And specifically, I mean, Facebook is the worst in my estimation. You cannot put something that is an advertisement that is false out on your platform. And then when you're notified that this is false, refuse to take it down. I think that we need to know who's the money behind the ads for number one. It's not just enough to say the citizens for oh, like yeah, good right. behavior, right? Yeah, I mean, forget about that. We, we need to know where is like, this coming from? Where is it source actually? Source of funds. Source of funds and the backers. And we need to know a lot more but about them. But until they know that, yeah. why not say you're a gazillion dollar company? Why not be out in front and say, you know what? I'm not letting this happen again. We're taking no political advertising until we figure out what's under the hood, source of yeah, funds. Yeah, yeah. Ha- like These tech companies remind me 100% of the financial service industry. I can't, I feel like it's a freaking flashback for me. I mean, at the very least, they need fact checking, right? That's a new thing. But like, we didn't fact check the TV ads, mm-hmm. uh, but I think we need to present them with more context. Of course, the the conflict for any any platform and really, even in print, is sort of like, how do you present that? And where where is that seen? It's a super big conflict for them. And any action that you're describing, which makes sense to us, is the act of a publisher, once again. Right, because and, they are publishers. So whatever. I think, yeah. I'll just speak for myself. I think they're publishers. They have abdicated responsibility. They hide like, oh, we're just the pipes. We don't care about what flows through the pipes. It's baloney. It's like, it just, it's not reality is what it, it has turned into. I would, I would only ask that the sins of Facebook not be conflated with all of every technology company. Okay, fair and, enough. And now I would also say... What company isn't a technology company these days? I mean, we're, we're these big consumer tech brands for sure have dominated because they're part of our lives. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm not going to DuckDuckGo, right? I'm using Google. I mean, I'm a fan of Google. Yeah. And I, and I do trust them. Maybe, Although, like, that whole YouTube you know, thing is a little scary. YouTube has had problems for a long time why because of this. Why not just spin it out and, like, run? That's a good like, question. I don't why know. Why don't they spin this crap out? Like, Well, I suspect because it makes a lot of money. Yeah, but it could make money yeah. on its own. It could. It could. I don't know. I don't know. We don't have the answers to everything. Karen, before we let you go, you said, you know, when we started, I said the best career or financial decision that you've made. And you basically said like, hey, I kind of like made myself indispensable and made a career change and got into a little company called Google. Mm -hmm. What was the worst career decision that you made? The worst. I had a terrible, I've had several terrible work experiences one of them was with the same guy who I'd worked with at PC World and Macworld. Some years later, he was the publisher of a magazine no longer with us called Upside. It was essentially the business side of of technology business. It was on its way down at the time is what I discovered. The workplace environment at that place, it was like dead air walking in there. It was the only time I've ever had a yelling match with a colleague. And it just had a poisonous atmosphere. That place. I don't blame it all on him, but it was it was a bad like year and a half, and then I got out. I even liked the work I did, but it was still like every day was just a pain to go there. So I think my lesson out of that and my advice is, you know, when the atmosphere is poison, out. get out. You're listening to Jill on Money. Okay, it's time for the Marcus Minute. We're presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs in the hot seat today. Karen Wickery, she's the author of Taking the Work Out of Networking. Are you ready to play? I'm ready. What's one word to describe your relationship with money? Complex. What's always worth spending on? Experience. What's the dumbest thing you've spent money on? A technology. (laughs) How much do you spend? This is a good funny question. How much do you spend on a haircut? $55. $55. Very nice. It's your last day on earth. You've got $100 in your pocket. How would you spend it on your last meal? And what would that last meal be? It would be at Zuni Cafe in San Francisco. And I'd have the roast chicken. Karen Wickery. Did I say it right? You did. Thank God. Taking the work out of networking is the book. And we are delighted that you've joined us today. Thanks for coming in. Oh, so much fun. Thank you, Jill. 
Thanks to Karen Wickery, the book is called Taking the Work Out of Networking. We drop new episodes of Jill on Money every Tuesday and Thursday, and sometimes we sneak in a Friday bonus too. If you don't want to miss one bit of this content, then subscribe to our podcast. You can do that anywhere you find your favorite podcast. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer and self-proclaimed best artist when it comes to making pasta and sauce. We are distributed by Cadence 13, and our show is presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs.